Okay, so tonight we will look at the uh, the last our last uh, session, session seven. We're looking at uh, the second and third uh, letters uh, of John. Remember, uh, John wrote um, more than likely wrote uh, the book of Revelation first, or he had the revelation uh, first while he was exiled on the island of Patmos. Uh, then he wrote it down, and then uh, we think a lot of we think that kind of happened first, and then he wrote the gospel of John, as we call it. And then later he wrote these uh, three letters. So just a, a, a great a body of work when you put them all together as John the Apostle is, is writing these. Once again, remembering that John is the last surviving uh, of the disciples. Uh, so therefore, a very important voice uh, in making sure that the truth of the Christian faith uh, is, is spread uh, uh, correctly. So we'll see here in these, um, so second, uh, second John, second and third John were never intended to stand alone. If we kind of get the idea that, that these three letters travel together. Now they were, they were not letters like you and I think of letters, they were scrolls. And it's quite possible that they were all on one scroll, uh, but uh, they, they didn't, weren't intended to uh, travel alone. Uh, they went together as a set. Uh, and so kind of cover letters would be a, maybe a way to say that uh, they introduced uh, second John introduced uh, basically first John and third John kind of helped uh, with that a little bit too. Uh, they came with first John cover letters uh, here. They were personal greetings from the elder to each of the Christian communities of the province of Asia Minor that are receiving first, second and third John. So they were more of a personal first or second and third John uh, were more personal letters, more so than first John, the bigger letter was kind of intended to go towards many churches that were joined in the Asia Minor area. The chief uh, congregation in Asia Minor was Ephesus, as we've, we've talked about. And then you had these other smaller uh, churches uh, nearby. One way to think about that would be using our own kind of contemporary setting. Think about the uh, circuit churches uh, in Evansville of the LCMS. We have, I believe, 10 uh, in the kind of the greater uh, LCMS uh, area, the uh, 10 circuit churches. So imagine uh, the letters, these three letters uh, being circulated from church to church. So we would receive these three letters. We'd understand it's from the elder uh, John, uh, we would read it together. Now, remember, these weren't huge churches. These were, these were house churches uh, meeting in people's homes. And so they would uh, get these letters. They would read, uh, probably read 2nd and 3rd John as cover letters, then read uh, John itself. And then after they were done reading it, uh, they would deliver it, a uh, messenger uh, or a traveler on a, on a trip or whatever, would deliver it to the next uh, community. So imagine we got that here at, at maybe at our church at St. Paul's. We read it together as a congregation, and then and then we had somebody um, whom whom we trust uh, would take this letter over to Concordia, and they would read it, and then maybe over to um, the geographically. I don't know what that would be. Maybe up to Emmanuel or however. So that's kind of how these letters were uh, circulated, much like uh, the Pauline epistles. Uh, these letters were delivered uh, from church to church. Um, yeah, he uses the word here, or the word used here for the elder. Notice that's the uh, got the direct. Uh, that's not the right word. I'll say direct object. That's not it. Definite article. Uh, the elder is used here. The Greek word there is presbyteros. Uh, you recognize. Uh, you recognize uh, presbyteros. Uh, yes, it does mean, in fact, uh, Presbyterian, where we get that Presbyterian. If you know anything about the Presbyterian Church, you'll know that it's in, in many ways is a top-down kind of structure. You have a, a similar to the to the Roman Catholic to a degree, uh, but you kind of have a top-down hierarchy. And so a Presbyterian uh, or Presbyter Pre was kind of the chief elder. It was a, a formal term to describe the the chief leader or teacher. Uh, you'll see this word used uh, in First uh, Timothy three. Uh, one, the Apostle Paul is describing uh, these uh, overseers. Uh, that's a, an interesting uh, uh, way to understand a pastor as an overseer. Somebody who is an overseer is somebody who sees over things and not just uh, some of the small stuff, but the big stuff, just kind of making sure that the congregation is cared for as they need to be. 
So that word uh, presbyter Presbyterios was used uh, there by Paul and, and 1 Timothy to describe the overseer. But once again, it's the elder. Uh, notice how in, in 1 John, 2 3 John, it's the elder, not an elder. Uh, in 1 Timothy, uh, Paul talks about it. Everybody wants to be an elder. Uh, but here in these letters, it's a title. It's the elder. In the New Testament time, it's the only time where this includes uh, what's called the elder, but there's no name attached to it. Uh, Paul will talk about, or Peter himself, I guess, would talk about the elders, and he would say, I am one of them. But here, it's just stated the elder, and there's just a general understanding that this is referring uh, to, to, the, to John. Uh, John is uh, known to all, and he does not need to introduce himself in person. Uh, for decades, John had been in the company of the Christians as a brother and as a father uh, in the faith. And it just really, <clears throat> John just seems to be one of those uh, disciples that uh, when I get to heaven, he's the first one I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seek out. He just seems to have, as you put these letters together, at least for me personally, when you put all these letters together, you have, you have the heart of a pastor uh, who's whose who's theology is deep and rich, his Christology, his focus on Christ, uh, but he has such a heart uh, for the people he's sharing Christ with. And I'm not saying that the Apostle Paul didn't have that. Uh, Paul seemed to be obviously very caring for uh, his people, uh, but a little rough around the edges, uh, maybe similar to a Martin Luther, who was definitely rough around the edges. But here, John just tends, tends to have more of a, a tenderness as he's uh, sharing, uh, sharing the truth. So he's well known in that area as the last surviving uh, disciple, as the elder. Uh, and there is a, um, it's not, when we hear the word elder today, we might think in terms of age, elderly, we use that expression. Uh, but it's not necessarily that, it's just chief. It's just the head, head person, the most important or the most recognized in that position. Although uh, by this time, John is indeed uh, what we might say elderly. Uh, this is probably in the year 90, 85, 90, 95. Uh, so he's, he's well advanced in age. He's definitely the elderly elder, uh, but definitely uh, that respect is given there for his leadership in the church. Second John introduces themes that will be expounded upon in First John. Uh, so once again, here in this very short letter, just a few verses, uh, John and, and Second John uh, talks about truth. He talks about walking in the commandments, loving one another. That's all things that we've heard as we went through First John earlier. These are all uh, uh, really what, so once again, imagine cover letter comes first, or they're opening the scroll, and here's, here's, uh, here's this letter, which we now call Second John, basically giving a summary of here's about what, here's what you're going to get in the longer letter, you're going to get a, a good discussion, John says, on truth, walking the commandments, and loving one another. Uh, and then also this presence of false teachers, deceivers, and antichrists. So this would be maybe the table of contents as a cover letter uh, that John is writing here in Second John. The recipients, he says, to the chosen lady and her children whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth, which lives in us and will be with us uh, forever. Uh, it, kind of a run-on sentence where he uses the word truth uh, three times. Uh, so that's obviously important. But who is this uh, chosen lady and her children? A lot of different commentaries have a variety of answers on that, this chosen lady. Uh, some would, I'm sorry, I can't really see that, but some would say maybe it's an individual lady uh, and family. It's a specific person. He might have a specific person in mind. Uh, there's there's possibility uh, to that. Uh, the women played a very important and prominent role in the early church. Uh, you think of Eunice and Lois. You might remember them as the grandmother and the mother to uh, Timothy. Uh, they're uh, given prominent role in, in, in letter of First Timothy as the ones who brought Timothy to faith and kind of stoked the fires of that faith. Uh, then there's Priscilla. You remember or you know the name Priscilla, closely connected to Aquila. They were uh, tent makers in Ephesus uh, when uh, Paul was traveling through. So Priscilla. Lydia, you might remember her. Um, I forgot. I think she was in Philippi. She was the one lady that would go down. They would go in those days. 
what would happen with the believers would go to the synagogue and they would hear the word, the Old Testament word. And then after the synagogue, a lot of times they would travel to a body of water, like a, a river uh, nearby. And, and I can't remember exactly the reference, uh, but Lydia is found and she's a seller of purple. Well, that uh, really means uh, she's pretty wealthy because purple was a pretty rare uh, color, very expensive uh, color. And so you have Lydia mentioned there and there's other uh, ladies that are mentioned. So it wouldn't be uncommon or it wouldn't be kind of out of the ordinary for for maybe the disciple to be writing or uh, John the apostle to be writing to a specific woman and her children. Somebody even specu speculated uh, that, uh, and I don't know if I buy this or not, but it's, it's interesting, makes for an interesting theory, that he might be writing to a very important chosen lady uh, in Ephesus. And as we talked about, I believe, several weeks ago, uh, when we were talking about kind of the history of these letters, uh, who would be that very specific, important, chosen lady that was very close to the Apostle John? And you hopefully remember uh, that would be Mary, the mother of the Lord. Remember, Mary was at the foot of the cross, was given uh, charge to John. John was to take care of her. And we know that from that time on, John took Mary into his home. Uh, and so it could be quite possible that that John is writing this letter to Mother Mary and her children. But that seems a little far-fetched, but I can't rule it out. Uh, but generally speaking, um, uh, generally speaking, most historic, most of the uh, uh, scholars tend to see this as a kind of a, I don't know if it's colloquialism. I don't know if that's, that's a big fancy word. It might not apply here, but it's a fancy word. Uh, it, it might be just a way of describing uh, congregations. A lot of times churches were described in feminine uh, terms. Even Israel was uh, considered to be like the bride of God. And, and, and Hosea talks about that. And then, of course, in Ephesians, uh, just as the church, uh, you know, husbands love, love, love your wives just as Christ loves the church, his bride. So it wouldn't be uncommon for that. So it, it could be one of those things where John, remember he is writing, there's still persecution towards the Christians going on. And so instead of writing to a specific congregation or a group of congregations and naming them, uh, the Christians in Ephesus or the Christians in Philippi or the Christians, of, you know, maybe it wouldn't be wise to kind of, kind of throw them under the bus like that. So maybe this was a way of just saying uh, the church in general uh, was uh, the chosen lady, or maybe a specific uh, church, Ephesus, and then the children would be the other churches in the circuit, as we're using that analogy. A network of house churches in and around Ephesus, all who know the truth. Uh, the truth brings these congregations together in, in love and unity. And a lot of these churches in Asia Minor were uh, re who received the Apostle Paul. Pa the Apostle Paul or maybe even Barnabas or Apollos or some of these other missionaries had come through and it preached the truth, and that truth was planted like a seed, uh, and it, it sprung forth. It took root, and it sprung forth. And so it's the truth that uh, brings these uh, congregations together. And once again, and, and maybe in a, a way of as, as an analogy, when we think about the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, uh, that's essentially what's going on here. All the churches of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod uh, pledged themselves together uh, because of their, they same say, they same speak the, the, the same word, the word of God, the same understanding of God's word, but also the confessions. And so they, they agree to walk together. The word synod means to walk together. So they are joined together in that uh, truth. So we see that in our, in our own day and age. But here we have these churches that are joined together as congregations in love and unity. Uh, together, uh, they walk in the truth, they obey the commandments, they love one another. These are all themes from First uh, John, uh, and they avoid false teachers. That really is a good summary of what a congregation in the first century should look like, as well as a congregation in the 21st century, uh, walking in the truth, knowing God's word, walking that truth, obeying the commandments, uh, loving one another, and then uh, being careful to avoid uh, false teachings and false doctrines. That walking in the truth, when I think of that, I remember uh, Jesus' words in Matthew. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. 
But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Now, uh, we could probably have our, our teachers in our group uh, lead us in the, uh, the song, you know, the wise man built his house upon the rock. Right? We could do that, uh, and the rains came a tumbling down. We could do that, but we won't. We won't do that. But we have this, you see the contrast here. You have the wise man who builds his house on the rock, and the foolish man builds the house on the sand. They both experience storms. Just because a house is on the rock doesn't mean that they're not going to have to deal with uh, the streams and the winds and all that. Uh, so both houses find themselves in, in dangerous positions, but only one house is able to stand the test of time, be able to weather the storm. Uh, and that, of course, is the house built on, on the rock. The house on the sand falls with a great crash. So Jesus tells us a mini uh, parable and then he explains it later, but he, he, he basically says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them in the practice, what does it mean by putting them in the practice? Well, uh, he means obeying them. It's not just hearing the word, but actually doing the word, uh, putting them in the practice, obeying the commandments. Uh, and, and that's what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Those who do this uh, show themselves to be built on the solid rock. Uh, how does how does that I kind of was thinking this through a little bit today when I was putting some of this together, but how does a sand Christian view the word of God? Well, I, I would think a sand Christian, somebody who uh, sees the word, uh, likes the word, enjoys the word, uh, as long as the word matches up to what I want to do, or, or as long as it uh, tells me what I want to hear, uh, that would be a kind of a sand Christian. They, everything is great. They, they follow the word. Uh, and, or, but they're not really all that committed uh, to the word. And so then when the storms come, and the storms will come, uh, they, uh, they, they kind of they fall with a great crash. Their, their faith is not strong enough to weather the storms because they really uh, didn't uh, trust uh, completely in the word, but maybe trusted in themselves or in other people. So it'd be a sand uh, Christian that kind of changes uh, by the ebbs and flows. Uh, when the storms come, uh, they, they don't stand. A rock uh, Christian uh, would be one that says, this is what God says. I might not understand it, and it might, it, it might be offensive to me. Uh, God's word might accuse me, and God's word might kind of put me in my place, and God's word might ruin all my fun and spoil all my pleasure, but God's word is, in fact, God's word, and uh, here I stand. I could do no other. That kind of a rock uh, Christian. And that doesn't mean that just because they're built on the rock, they're not going to have those storms. Sometimes those storms will even be worse uh, because they are uh, built upon the solid foundation of Christ. Uh, it's not just the storms of the world uh, that, that beat up against them, but of course the devil and all the, the principalities of this dark world. Uh, sometimes Christians lull themselves into thinking that uh, I trust in Christ, I read his word, I study his scriptures, so why is all this happening to me? Uh, but uh, a rock Christian recognizes that they are built on that solid foundation, uh, and uh, that foundation, of course, is Christ and his word. James would say, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. So uh, <clears throat> just hearing the word, of course, is important because, if you know, the spirit works through the word. Uh, but we, we live according to that word. We uh, do the word. So we're listeners of the word, but we're also doers, uh, doers of the word. And uh, so we talk the talk and we walk the walk. That's a uh, bumper sticker if you wanted a new bumper sticker talk the talk and walk the walk so john is really kind of explaining this when he's when he's and just in this brief letter he's reminding his 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 hearers his audience to walk in the truth watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for but you may be rewarded fully anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of christ does not have god whoever continues in the teaching has both the father and the son if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, uh, do not take him into your house or welcome him. 
Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. Now he's jumping here into these false teachers that were uh, present. So when he says that phrase, anyone who runs ahead, this is really where the Gnostics were. Uh, they took this truth of the, the gospel and it wasn't enough. So they ran ahead. They had more knowledge. So they ran ahead of the rest of the congregation. Uh, so, they, so they thought. Uh, they, they ran ahead and tried to drag the congregation with them. So John is saying anyone who runs ahead and does not continue the teaching of Christ. Remember, they didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ, uh, the Savior. Uh, so they're not of God. Uh, and, but anyone who does uh, believe that Jesus is the Christ is of God. And then we have this whole idea of hospitality. Do not take them uh, into your house. Uh, kind of the, the background would be uh, maybe more of a missionary. I don't know if I put them in, the, in this or not. Maybe this is an individual, uh, individual inv individually as an expression of hospitality. Uh, so uh, missionaries would travel around, and a lot of times they, they did have to bring I don't want to say paper sounds the right way, but usually they, they'd bring a letter that would verify their authority. Uh, and, and so these, perhaps these false teachers were uh, feeling like they had the authority to go from house to house uh, to try to, to, to win people over to their way of thinking. Uh, and John is telling uh, uh, individuals, don't welcome them into your house. Don't show them hospitality. Now, he's not saying treat them horrible and, and, and all that. Uh, and he's probably going at more here. Um, I was trying to think of a contemporary expression or a contemporary thing that maybe we might be familiar with. Uh, maybe somebody like we picked on these people already, I guess. But the uh, the Jehovah's Witness or the uh, the Mormons, you know, they uh, they come and knock on the door, and I get asked this all the time, Pastor. What should I do? Should I bring them into my house and talk with them? And uh, I think in those situations, if you know, obviously that they need to hear God's word. Uh, they might not want to hear it, or they think they already know it. They've run ahead of us. Uh, but, but we do need to, uh, if we're comfortable and confident and trust the course of spirit to give us the words we need to speak, uh, invite them in our house, have those dialogues. I know many of you have done that. We've, I've talked with some of you about that and, and maybe continued uh, that connection to try to, to win them back to the truth. But this is, I think, more of a... Um, the Mormons, as far as I know, the Mormons of Jehovah's Witness, they don't come into your house and say, hey, can I stay here the night, okay? But in those days, in the missionaries, they would not just come and preach what they were preaching, but then you would show hospitality by taking them in, feeding them, giving them a place to live, uh, sometimes indefinitely, uh, until uh, they moved on to the next place. That's how Paul uh, was. Uh, so what John is saying here is, you know, you want to listen to them, you know, kind of show that kind of hospitality, but don't bring them into your homes. And, and don't let them stay overnight and kind of convey to all the public around uh, that you agree with them. So there's a really kind of a fine line there. I really think that's kind of what he's getting at. Uh, why would that be dangerous? Why would it be dangerous to continue to associate with those who are, especially in this case, teaching that Jesus wasn't the Christ, that he wasn't the savior of the world? Uh, and people know that that's what that missionary teaches because he's been proclaiming that. Uh, and, and they see you taking them into the house over and over again, they might start wondering about your own witness. Do you really believe uh, that Jesus is the Savior? Because you keep associating yourself with those who don't. So that would be, the, I think, the dangerous part of individually uh, maybe open your house in more, more of a general sense than just a, a chat at the front door. But I think probably more than likely, this is more of a corporate kind of idea into your house meaning your church house remember they met in homes so allowing these false teachers these false missionaries uh to come in and to have an opportunity to preach uh in your house church or to teach uh in your house church. imagine what would happen if we were to invite not a former Jehovah's witness or a former church of latter-day saints member but a very active member uh, who was who was not interested in changing their hearts or their minds, and we were to invite them in uh, to our church uh, repeatedly uh, to teach our uh, our Sunday morning Bible study or something like that, or maybe even to stand in a pulpit. We would never do that, right? But but this is what he's warning them against, because when you do that corporately, then you really are uh, confusing 
the not just uh, the people in the pews and have pews back in those days, but you're not just confusing the people that are there. What do we really believe? Uh, but you're also confusing uh, the people on the outside of the church who are trying to figure out what do the Christian, what do Christians really believe? We don't think this guy or this guy teaches different. Uh, so what you do publicly as a church, what we do publicly as a church is, is very important. And that's really what he's trying to get at here. Um, Christians are always to be concerned about what we say and do publicly, both individually uh, and corporately. Uh, and then that's not always easy. Sometimes the church has to say no uh, to certain things when, uh, when others say yes. And it's hard for us sometimes as we don't like to be in that position. Uh, but uh, it's important that we remember that what we do, uh, what we say and do gives a witness. It speaks uh, to what we believe. It flows from our doctrine and our theology. So we always have to be careful. Uh, what we're doing. <coughs> Excuse me. Truth of God's word, including the gospel, can be comp compromised to the outside and inside observers. We want to make everything clear. We don't want to make yeah, things confusing. Uh, it's hard enough. We want, to, we want to make sure that the gospel, the truth of God's word, is clearly articulated without any confusion. Uh, and so that's why it's important to be careful who we welcome so I guess that's uh, Second John. Now uh, Third John takes just a little bit of a different uh, approach. It's not written to a group of people, but rather written to uh, a, one specific person named Gaius. Uh, John writes here to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. There's that word truth again. Um, agape to you you under you know the word agape agape to a dear friend might be translated beloved. Um, Gaius uh, uh, means to rejoice, be glad. Yes, this is in fact where we get the word gay, uh, to be merry, to be full of uh, joy, uh, to be glad in your demeanor. Uh, so Gaius is his name. Uh, so Christian love, which flows from the koinonia, uh, fellowship in the truth, uh, brings them together, but brotherly love and friendship is also present. So it's, it's not just they believe the same things, and so therefore they're joined in koinonia and the truth, but that uh, fellowship in the truth actually develops their affection for one another. It increases that affection for one another. Uh, and, and that's not rocket science, is it? I mean, think about our, our congregation. We are united in the truth in that koinonia. And as we gather around that koinonia and worship and in Bible study, what does it do? We love each other. Uh, we, we, this is, you know, we, we want to be together. We want to share in each other's lives. Uh, that's that's kind of what's going on here. So John has this dear friend, this beloved friend, uh, Gaius, uh, who they're joined together in the truth, but they actually have this uh, kind of the brotherly love as well. That's a, that's a great thing. Uh, Gaius, uh, there's several of uh, that name mentioned in the uh, New Testament. We're not entirely sure if this Gaius that, uh, or Gaius that, um, that John is dealing with here is is one of these mentioned. It's a very common Roman name, Gaius Julius Caesar, Gaius Octavius. Uh, so it's a it's a common name. So some have wondered, is this Gaius? Is uh, I don't know if it's Gaius or Gaius. I didn't look at the pronunciation, but some have wondered maybe he was a pastor, um, maybe just a leader in the church, uh, patron of the house church. A patron meaning the one who owns the house. Uh, which would mean he'd probably be fairly wealthy uh, to be able to have a house large enough uh, for families or for Christians to gather. Uh, but we don't exactly know what his position was. And, you know, so it's quite possible that John is writing these three letters and he's entrusting his, his beloved dear friend uh, Gaius to take these letters and make sure they get to the right spot, make sure that they're circulated. So he could be a pastor doing that. It could be a leader. Uh, so there's also three main points in this short letter. Uh, he uses that word beloved, but he's he's really just praying for uh, this beloved friend and and a commendation for them that it may be that that you may be in good health as it goes with your soul. So you see physical and spiritual there, right? He's really concerned for his friend here, physical health, also his spiritual health. He's commending his friend uh, for continuing to walk in, in the truth. Now that wouldn't be that wouldn't be necessarily easy to do 
uh, to walk in the truth, especially with all this uh, division already happening within the church. Uh, you, uh, it just, just the division going on, it's not easy to, to walk in the truth. So there's a commendation here, you know, keep it up. I'm so uh, glad to know that you are staying in this truth. Um, truth is not just head knowledge. Truth is not just believe. Truth is lived. It's what we pattern our life after. It's how we conduct ourselves. It's our habit, our lifestyle. Uh, so this all kind of fits together when we looked at First uh, John. Uh, note John's uh, fatherly uh, care here. We don't know if they're contemporaries in age, uh, or uh, but there's there's kind of a father-child kind of relationship here, uh, and it's still friendship, still beloved friendship. But uh, I had a uh, my youth uh, youth director uh, in high school. Uh, he seemed really old at the time, but he, you know, but I was young. Uh, but we kind of had that really close relationship. Uh, he and I did, and, and he and all of the youth group uh, members. But there was sometimes a fatherly approach. I mean, we're 16, 17, 18, and he, I think he was 30. Uh, you know, so there's kind of that uh, we're friends and all that, but there's still this uh, recognition that he has a little bit more life and a lot, a lot more life and a lot more wisdom. Uh, so that could be what's going on here uh, in this relationship. He has a request. Uh, he says, welcome the strangers uh, who told me about you. Um, these are traveling uh, missionaries. Uh, once again, we've talked about them, but uh, the members of the congregation uh, held various occupations. They faithfully served the Lord in their various vocations. They were not equipped to be missionaries. So these were uh, a kind of a formal position, maybe similar I guess similar to what we do uh, today, but of course, everybody was given the charge uh, to share the gospel. Uh, going back to the names we brought up before, Priscilla and Aquila, they were tent makers by trade, but they were all, that was their vocation, their occupation. Uh, but in their vocation as, as believers, they were always looking for ways to share their faith. But there was uh, definitely specific missionaries that, uh, that this is what they did. They 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 were specifically uh, trained or, or called, I guess, to go out and, and to share uh, the gospel. Now, Paul, as you know, was a, obviously a missionary. That's what he did. He went from church to church, location to location. Uh, he also practiced uh, his, his own uh, occupation uh, during the day, which was, as you hopefully know, was he was also a tent maker. That's how he got to know Priscilla and Aquila. So during the day, uh, Paul would uh, make tents. And then in the evening, uh, he would uh, be a missionary. Uh, but there were others that were just really called to be these uh, missionaries traveling around. You think about our own cult, uh, culture or our context today. Um, well, for instance, we in our congregation, uh, we have the Sorges and we have the Pauls, uh, both uh, sharing uh, the gospel in different uh, venues or different locations. But uh, uh, Pastor Paul has been called and trained uh, and that's what he does. Um, Brian and, and, uh, and Barb, uh, they have other occupations, uh, but in those occupations, uh, they look for opportunities to share the gospel. So, but here, uh, these were more specifically uh, trained and, and called missionaries that were traveling. Missionaries' primary purpose is to share the gospel and to preach the word. What does it take to be a missionary? I actually thought, uh, believe it or not, when I was growing up, the same uh, youth pastor I was uh, telling you, or not he wasn't a pastor, youth leader I was telling you about, uh, when I started to think in terms of feeling like maybe I wanted to be a pastor, I wanted to be a church worker of some sort when I was uh, probably by the middle of my junior year of high school, uh, he was really trying to push me towards being a missionary. And uh, my first thought was, that'd be cool. I get to go over to other areas of the country and share the good news. And then I thought, well, um, but I don't know anything about other countries. I don't know anything about other cultures. Uh, and it, it was too, I don't want to say it this way, but it was too scary for me to think in terms of uh, being in some other location. Uh, so it just really wasn't something that um, I felt called to do. Uh, and when I got to college, several of my friends, uh, a couple of them were still friends with, uh, I was talking to him uh, our freshman year of college, and there was a big difference. He wanted to be a pastor like I wanted to be a pastor, but he was absolutely felt certain that he was going to be a missionary. There was just a difference in how uh, we felt the Lord was leading us. Uh, so 
what does it take to be a missionary? Well, obviously, you can list a whole bunch of qualities, but uh, a desire to get to know the people of the culture, uh, to not try to uh, change their culture per se, or, or you got to get to know who they are and then uh, bring the word of God to bear in their setting. Uh, so this is, it looks like John is dealing with uh, this a little bit as these, these missionaries are traveling. And he's, he's kind of addressing this for a specific point here. Uh, he wants uh, a Gaius to, to take care of the missionaries, uh, send them on their way with support and encouragement, uh, show hospitality toward them, pray for them, uh, support them financially. See, these are the ones he's saying, now welcome into your home. You know, don't just stand at the door with a door open like this, you know, like we would do with the Jewish witness of the Mormons. Don't just stand with the door, but open the door, bring them in because they, they've been entrusted with this truth, bring them in, uh, show hospitality, pray for them, and in, encourage your people that are gathered uh, to send them on financially so they can go to the next stop, the next city uh, with this good news, and defend them. Uh, and, well, well, that's kind of strange. What would we have to defend them from? Well, uh, because there was conflict in the churches already. Uh, it, here in Third John, we, we see this guy named uh, Diotrephes, I don't even say, I don't think I'm saying that right, but Diot, Diotrephes, well, you get it, you can see it, all right, uh, pastor or a leader, uh, he loves to be first, uh, he gossips and he slanders John, this is here, once again, in third letter of John, he slanders John, the elder, uh, he's rejecting the missionaries, when the, el the, the missionaries come that John has approved, this guy, Diotrephes, uh, says, get out of here, you're not welcome here. I'm uh, the voice that should be heard. He, he loved to be first. Listen to me. Uh, don't listen to that uh, John guy. He gossips and he slanders. And this is somebody within the church itself. Uh, this kind of helps us understand First John a little bit more, doesn't it? That this, it's, it's an organized, in many ways, movement within the, in this early church led by this uh, leader uh, who's specifically trying to undermine the authority of John. Uh, by rejecting the people that John is sending. He prevents others from welcoming the mission. Not only is he saying you can't come into this church to preach your word, but if you are welcoming these missionaries into your home, then you're in trouble. So, the, so he really was, uh, well, obviously a bad dude. Uh, and uh, so this is, why, this is why it's interesting. Uh, if you see... If you look at the entirety of the Pauline scriptures, uh, Paul's letters, Paul would have a different approach <laughs> to a situation like this, I would think. Paul, I guess, if I'm reading Paul right, would kind of be more of a bull in a china closet in this and clear out. You know, you could think of the way he treated the Galatians and their false teachers. Uh, but he would just, but you, you kind of, you see John going at it from a different way. Uh, he, he recognizes this is a dangerous thing. Uh, and he, he doesn't want this to happen in this uh, congregation. Uh, so once again, yeah, uh, this is what this guy's doing. Uh, he had broken fellowship with John and was now threatening to take the whole house church with him. So John's response is, is in a thoughtful and loving kind of approach, maybe a little bit different than Paul would do. Um, and I'll get back to that in just a second. So what would cause divisions within the church? Well, all kinds of things. Uh, Sorry, uh, presence of false teachings could cause divisions. Uh, presence of false teachers, uh, unrepentant sin, uh, power and control. Uh, I think in our, um, I think all those things, of course, could be present in the modern day Christian church. And we probably could all cite examples of that, not just in the uh, other church bodies out there, but even within our own beloved uh, church body. But that individual uh, pursuit of power and control, uh, that is a real, uh, could be a real struggle within the local congregation. Uh, and, and every congregation kind of deals with that in, in some ways. Uh, who has the authority? Who has the, the power? Who, who, who has the control? Those are all words that are sinful because uh, in, 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 they're not used in the right uh, context. This is indeed uh, supposed to be a, a partnership in the gospel where we, the body of Christ analogy, we all have a specific role uh, to play. 
uh, and not one part is more important than another. And keeping things in that proper context is important, but some congregations lose sight of that. And there's a wrestling for, uh, for power uh, to be able to take the congregation in a certain direction and another group comes along and says, we wanna go this direction. And then there's a uh, conflict. And what happens a lot when there's a church in conflict, uh, what's not happening? The gospel is not being proclaimed. Uh, the truth of God's word is not being honored. The commandments are not being kept. Uh, there's uh, all kinds of problems. So what's really going on when there's a quest for power and control? What's really going on? Well, you know, the devil is going on. Uh, this is the easiest way for him to stop uh, the advancement of the gospel, uh, to stop it from being proclaimed, is to get the people who, who are joined together in that gospel, in that koinonia, to get them to fracture, uh, to divide and conquer, to pull them apart from each other. So this was apparently already happening in the early church, and John has got to deal with this. Uh, did John ever deal with the person John, the disciple John, the apostle John, ever deal with that issue of power and control? Can you think of anything from the gospels? <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of evidence or, uh, examples of this. Um, John and James, uh, their mother, had pulled Jesus aside. And you remember what mom said, dear mommy? Mommy said, hey, uh, can I get my, my boys to sit at your right hand and your left hand? Well, what is that a request for? That's a request for power and control. Uh, that's all that was. Uh, they wanted positions. I would assume, maybe I shouldn't assume, I would assume it's not recorded in the scripture that James and John didn't pull mom aside and said, no, mom, we don't want that. We want to be servants. Uh, and you're talking about, now that's not what Jesus is all about. Uh, you kind of wonder uh, uh, when mom is talking to Jesus that the, the sons are kind of like, okay, mom, let's get it, get it right. You know, make sure he does this for you. And then Jesus speaks these words. You know that those who regarded as rulers of Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. I said, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus has to explain to James and John, to James and John's mother, uh, and to the disciples that true greatness is found in being a servant. And as you know, with the disciples, that was their favorite argument. Who is the greatest? Who's the most important? Who's going to have power and control when Jesus is gone? Uh, or when Jesus goes on into his throne, uh, who's going to be the number one? Uh, uh, so this was always a struggle for the disciples, it was a struggle for John. And now you, uh, you see John's heart as he's trying to deal with this happening uh, within the congregation that he loves. So he gives them an exhortation. I'm uh, sure he gave Gaius his exhortation. Do not imitate what is evil, uh, but rather imitate what is good. Don't imitate what is evil, which would be this uh, Diotrephes, I should have looked that up, um, who rejected John the truth and a true missionary is all for selfish gain and advancement. Don't imitate him, that's evil but rather imitate what is good. There's another guy he, he mentions, uh, Demetrius. Uh, Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone, uh, well spoken of by the truth and well spoken of by John. Uh, so there's this conflict within this congregation and what uh, John is saying to this leader, whoever Gaius is or Gaius is, is this, this evil one, uh, don't listen to him. But rather, you have somebody in the church, a leader in the church, Demetrius, uh, that I recommend. And he knows the truth. And he's, everybody speaks well of him. They don't speak well of this other guy. Uh, so this one is the one that you should follow and honor. Uh, so what, what John is doing there is he's trying to help this congregation in a struggle uh, to continue to be in the truth, even when they're dealing with these personalities, these, these leaders, these so-called leaders uh, in, the, in the church itself. John can't uh, fix all the problems, but he does uh, give a recommendation here of, of a leader that should be, is well spoken of, that should be followed. He's going to take you in the right direction, John is saying. Uh, he's going he's gonna to continue to take you in the, in the path of the truth, so follow him. And not this other one who rejects the truth, rejects missionaries, and rejects those who welcome these missionaries. Um, so, and then at the end here, you get, we get John is... Um, John is a pastor, 
and he wants to see his people face to face. He's writing these letters, uh, and it's important. Uh, we don't know where he's at necessarily, if he's writing from, where he's writing from, but uh, so he, but he wants, he's saying, I want to, I want to meet with you face to face. He says, um, something about right now I write with ink and paper. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. Um, you know, you, even though John wrote some, you know, book of revelation, wrote the gospel of John, these three letters, that's really not what he wants to do. He wants to be, he's a, person he's a, a personal pastor uh an elder and he wants to meet with him face to face uh and imagine how hard it would be to receive these letters and you're reading them and you know they're, that john sent these with love but you, you can't really follow up you can't what would you mean by that or or how are we supposed to respond to this uh, and you can't do that because you'd have to write those questions down you have to send it in a courier and then it would take you know weeks or months before you got a reply uh, and uh, just think about how difficult it is even today. We have all this uh, technology, all the social media, and how easy it is to misunderstand each other or misconstrue uh, a text or an email uh, to not get the right uh, tone or the right context of the message. Uh, it's even a challenge for us, and we could follow up with a quick text, but in those days, uh, it was a challenge as well. So he really wants to just meet with them. He probably just wants to sit down with the leaders uh, and just kind of have a good old powwow. Let's Let's get back to where we need to be. Let's once again identify what the problems are. How are we going to deal with this uh, so that the church doesn't suffer? It's not continued to be pulled apart by these false teachers, but it continues to be this rock, uh, this foundation for, uh, for Asia Minor, for that area. Uh, so the gospel can be proclaimed uh, to all people. So that's really what he wants to do. We don't know if he ever was able to do that or not. We don't have any record of whether he was actually able to have face-to-face -face meeting with, with Gaius or these leaders. So in conclusion, uh, his last words, um, uh, uh, peace to you. Uh, now, just simple words. We use those all the time in church. And uh, uh, when I see those words, especially connected to the Apostle John, uh, I remember uh, I remember John, you know, where John, uh, the gospel of John, where he's uh, recording Jesus re, uh, at his resurrect, excuse me, at his resurrection. And he appears to the disciples who are terrified. They're afraid for their own lives. Uh, they're huddled together in the empty room. And there's the disciple John right there with him, uh, huddled together to terrified and afraid. And Jesus appears to them. And uh, there's a lot he could have said to them. <laughs> he could have said a lot. Like, uh, where were you guys when I needed you? Uh, he could have he chastised them. He could have, you know, come down pretty hard on them. Uh, you all said you were going to stand next to me, and then when the going got tough, you guys got out of town. Well, you at least, you know, got out of the area. Uh, and where were you when I needed you? And, and, and he could have really, that's what they felt they needed to hear. They were already burdened by that guilt, by that shame, by that embarrassment. Uh, they had failed miserably. Uh, and so he could have come at them with the word of law and bludgeoned them, uh, and he had every right to as a son of God, uh, but that's not what they needed to hear. He comes at them with uh, a very tender word, uh, peace uh, be with you, uh, and I think, I might be reading into it too much, but if you take John and you take these, the gospel and you take these letters together, uh, once again, we've done this before, but I think that peace, me, uh, peace to you means this. Uh, peace be with you, and peace be with you. Uh, not only do they have uh, peace with the risen Christ who had, who had died and risen, show them as nail marks. Uh, they, their, their relationship had been changed uh, because of Jesus' death and resurrection. They were not at war with God. They were not as enemies. Uh, they were at peace with God, but it also uh, brought peace in their relationships together as disciples. And, and that peace was uh, so important. And so here, John, as he's writing this tender letter, these three tender letters uh, to the congregation uh, that he loves, his beloved children, he's writing this letter. He really just summarizes it by just reminding them, hey, peace be with you. Uh, have this peace in Christ, uh, the one who's died and risen for you, and be at peace uh, with one another um, as you seek uh, to follow Christ and, and share that truth with the world. So that's kind of his conclusion to these letters, and that will be my conclusion as well. 
uh, to our, our Bible study. Uh, I really have enjoyed uh, going through these letters again. It's been a while since I've looked at them uh, to see them directly connected to the gospel of John. Uh, and uh, so I hope that you've enjoyed that as well. And uh, we'll stop there. Then I'll take some questions.